Welcome back to Rockstock Channel. It is Monday, March 11th at 10 a.m. And we are very privileged to have today Paul Graves, the CEO of Arcadium, the new name for the merged Livent and Allchem, a merger which was consummated at the beginning of this year. Among the myriad of lithium voices, Paul's market commentary and articulation of Arcadium's position within the lithium industry is second to none in my view. With strong training from a successful career in investment banking, the silver tongue from Goldman Sachs substantially enhances our understanding in each quarterly earnings call. I have suggested that Paul is a CEO to watch in 2024. Arcadium presents a unique lithium pure play, a sizable US and ASX listed producer that is at the same time an Argentina proxy, a DLE proxy, and a proxy for the burgeoning James Bay region of Quebec. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Lithium Royalty Corp, ticker symbol LIRC on the Toronto Stock Exchange. LRC has royalties on lithium companies, including Sigma, Winsome Resources, and Arcadium's Mount Catlin. And don't forget, if you'd like to receive our Lithium Iron Bull newsletter directly to your email box, register your email at rkequity.com. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. I've been following Paul since he was CFO of FMC, preparing for the spinoff of Livent in October 2018. I narrated that spinoff through the prism of Elton John's Philadelphia Freedom, considering Paul's UK lineage and the location of Livent's corporate headquarters. I have also compared Paul and Livent to Rocky Balboa, the most famous underdog from Livent's home city of brotherly love. In case you're wondering why I'm wearing this sweatshirt. At its peak in late 2022, Legacy Livent had doubled from its IPO price. But my long-term, gonna fly now narrative has proved wrong so far. Arcadium's share price today since IPO, adjusted for the merger, is down 28%, underperforming its peers Albemarle, SQM, Ganfeng, Pilbara, and Mineral Resources. It's been a rocky road. Ganfeng, which undertook a Hong Kong IPO the same month of the Livent IPO, is up 52% during this period. Pilbara is up more than five times and sports an enterprise value of about $6 billion, inclusive of $2 billion in net cash, which compares to Arcadium's $5 billion enterprise value, inclusive of about $250 million net cash. Paul and Arcadium have put lots of information into the public domain in recent weeks, publishing Q4 and year-end results a 10K, and giving fireside chats at the BMO and Bank of America mining conferences. Following this introduction today is 17 minutes of relevant Q&A excerpted from these public conversations, which will serve as a point of departure to dive deeper into Paul and Arcadium's immediate and long-term plans and, vi and vision. We have included links to the transcripts and full videos of these conversations in the show notes below if you'd like further information. Not investment advice, but T.D. Cowan's David Deckelbaum articulated in our recent video that Arcadium is his top pick, with a $10 target price representing more than 100% upside to current ALTM price. He makes a relative value argument, suggesting Arcadium is trading about six and a half times 2025 consensus EBITDA of $750 million, and the fact that Arcadium's balance sheet and cash flow more than supports its continued growth and maintenance capex. Arcadium's year-end results included a helpful outlook scenario suggesting for 2024 a wide range of EBITDA based on current lithium chemical pricing of about $15,000 and the $25,000 price that Rodney and many others think is more likely required to sustain reinvestment economics long-term. At $15,000, Arcadium should earn $400 million. At $25,000, it should earn a billion. So at $5 billion enterprise value, Arcadium is currently trading on those outlook scenarios between 5 and 12 and a half times this year's EBITDA EBITDA. I attended PDAC in Toronto last week, which had more lithium booths than I had ever seen by far. The lithium rush I narrated 12 months ago is alive and well, despite the pervasive pessimism that's been reflected in the lithium price, equities, and broader EV narrative in recent months. We hosted our first virtual conference, Canada Rocks, almost exactly 12 months ago, and had the privilege then to interview Livent's Sarah Maricel to speak about Namaska, 
and all chems Martin Perez de Soleil to discuss James Bay. We look forward to some new color from Paul about these important development projects, as well as Arcadium's world-class resource and conversion assets in Argentina, North Carolina, China, and Japan. We believe that in the long run, the most successful um, lithium companies are going to be fully integrated. You're going to have control of the resource and you're going to have control of downstream processing and you're going to have control of the customer relationship. And, and they're all important. You know, people ask me sometimes, where is the value? The value is really spread throughout that chain. And, and what we saw was an opportunity to accelerate this plan of both growth and growth as an integrated business through the merger more than either one of us would have been able to do independently. Um, we certainly have complementary expertise, whether it's in downstream hydroxide or, or brine based processing or hard rock mining. And I think we also have a much stronger balance sheet uh, as a result of the transaction. It allows us to continue to invest as we're showing today through these cycles, while at the same time having greater operating efficiency, uh, higher margins, um, bigger and deeper relationships with customers. Allchem really made technical grade lithium carbonate. And in most market conditions, including today, that sells at a discount to battery grade lithium carbonate. Uh, Liven, because of its process, always made battery grade lithium carbonate. But because of our strategy, what we've done is taken most of that and we put it into the hydroxide network and make lithium hydroxide with it. The longer term benefit really from a revenue perspective is to take all of that battery grade legacy livent material and sell it and take all of that legacy all kind of technical grade material and put that into the hydroxide network it'll take us a little bit of time to do that we have to get requalified through the network we also have to reach an agreement with toyota tusho who have some rights over that material coming out of the legacy oloros facility uh, but given they want the same thing that we do which is to supply the battery grade market, and in their case, particularly the Toyota motor company supply chain broadly, we're pretty confident that they'll be aligned in wanting to do the same. We sell about three and a half thousand LCEs in butyl lithium, but we generate you know, 150, 200 million dollars of revenue there. We also are at very early stages of taking a long, hard look at, at the Oloro's conventional pond based systems and see if there's a way that, that Liven's legacy DLE or, or even the Iliad technology that we recently invested in with ESM um, has a potential application to improve the quality of the brine and therefore ultimately the quality of the carbonate. Yeah, in Salda Vida in Argentina is interesting. It's about 11 or 10, 11, 12 kilometers away, depending on where you measure from, from Liven's legacy Phoenix operations. It's just a cost trade-off, right? If, we, if we're moving concentrated chloride brine from Sal de Vida, either trucking it or maybe a pipeline could absolutely make sense. Oloros is a 25,000 ton expansion that was completed in Q4 by Allchem. Being a pond based system, it takes a lot longer to ramp that up. So we're expecting about 40% or so of that 25,000 ton to be saleable, to be produced and sold this calendar year, 2024. So that's 10,000 tons. Phoenix completed a 10,000 ton expansion. This is a DLE based process. So we're expecting about seven and a half thousand of those 10,000 tons to be available into the network this year. The US facility is full and sold the 15,000 tons that we have. So that's fully contracted and committed already. If we could add another 15,000 tons of hydroxide capacity in the US, that would be sold too. Like if we could add 30,000 tons of hydroxide capacity in the US, that would be sold too. The push, the demand, the drive for more IRA qualified material is very much hydroxide focused. Despite Western OEM's desire to move their supply chains outside China, they're not yet. That facility took us about eight months to build. The one we built in the US took about two years to build, a little bit less. It's 15,000 tons. The one we built in the US is five. The one in the US cost us $105 million. This one costs $21 million. If we were to build a 15,000 ton line in the US today, it's probably a $200 million investment compared to $21 million in China. There's a hard economics to argue with.
there's a few interesting aspects to Quebec. The resources are good, hard work resources. There is um, good infrastructure in terms of hydroelectric power. And I think that's a really important point as we think about sustainability in our industry. Um, Quebec itself has some, I think, some very good policies to attract customers into Quebec and is providing support at places like Beckencore to build infrastructure there. And it's IRA qualified material. It's, um, it's a location that certainly has the support of many US, North American automotive companies. So look, overall, it, we like it because it gives us geographical diversification. Our customers like it because it's IRA qualified material. Um, and, and so I do think it's going to be an important part of the non-China lithium landscape. While our objectives may come from different places, we both want the same thing. We want a successful Namaska project. We want it to sell to the best customers. Optimally, that will be customers that are reasonably closely located to Beck and Core. It's much easier with lithium hydroxide to, to have a customer that's close by than one that's a long way away, given the qualification, the product warranties you have to give, the challenges sometimes with, with those processes. I think we're all really quite closely aligned. Namask is sort of a, a single integrated entity, but, but under the right circumstances, there's opportunities to think about a downstream resource for uh, James Bay uh, at Beckencore, maybe even exactly the same location. You know, spodging prices are eight fifty, nine hundred dollars a ton, something like that. Now, if these prices uh, stay spot spodge, I mean, do you run on Catlin in twenty twenty five? Probably not. I mean, what price point do you need to keep it going? They, you know, fifteen hundred dollars a ton is where a lot of investment decisions are being made in spodumene. Um, I think Mount Catlin needs pricing in that kind of range for, for it to make sense to extend the mine life another two or three years. If you're going to go underground, which is what comes after that two or three years, it's probably even a higher price. So, yeah, I think it's probably fair to say it. it it's hard to see Mount Catlin going on beyond two or three years, but it's entirely possible. I mean, who knows? Budgeting prices were six thousand dollars a ton not that long ago. Yeah, like Nara has, uh, for those who don't know, it was built in partnership with Toyota Tusho, the Japanese distribution arm of Toyota Motor Company. Toyota Tusho themselves. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, they're an investor in uh, the Yolo Rose asset, the former Oro Cobre asset down there in, in Argentina. Um, and they have, uh, you know, put a lot of capital to work. They're a major investor now in Arcadium. They built a 10,000 ton lithium hydroxide plant at Naraha in, uh, in, in, in Japan. It, it's still in that phase of being brought online. The, one of the challenges is that probably the tech, most technically demanding customer is the Japanese customer. Um, and so Naraha has a lot of learning to do um, to bring itself up to the point that it can in fact produce not only battery grade material, but get itself qualified into these, uh, some of these supply chains. It's still at the early stages of that. We've seen this ourselves. You know, we've built now five lithium hydroxide plants in the last five years, um, all of a similar size to Naraha. It, it take, there's a bit of a learning curve to get up that, that they're going through at the moment. And it is operated by Toyota Tusho, not by Arcadium. So uh, while we are planning to help them move it forward, we haven't done today. So it's, it's, it's a little bit earlier stage. If we put a contractual commitment in place with the customer, it is likely to be increasing volumes over the life of the contract. So if it's a five, six year contract, you know, volumes in year six will maybe two or even three X what they were in year one. We've made it clear that that requires investment on our part. And so we need certainty over price to deliver on that investment. We don't try to get greedy with floors. The whole point of a floor is not for us to earn what I call excessive profits. It's to protect us in environments like today where we want to keep investing. And more importantly, the customer wants us to keep investing. I think, I think it's really hard to do M&A to buy something or sell something when it's just a punt on where the lithium price might go in the long run because 
Um, who knows? And I think, you know, it's unlikely that you'll get perfect risk adjusted alignment between a buyer and a seller for cash purchases. I think the all chem live and merger structure is clearly the best way to do this. But I can speak from experience. They're not easy to put together. They're not easy to line up and they have their own, you know, challenges as to as to what needs to happen. I do believe being a single resource lithium company is not a viable structure in the long run. It's extremely difficult to run your business with just a single resource, even if it's an integrated one. And so I think there will be more pressure to be larger, to have multiple resources in multiple geographies, to be able to serve your customers with multiple products. I think that's going to have to result in some M&A. I don't know it's easy to do at a low price environment, easy to do at a high price environment. It's definitely easier to do in a stable price environment. And so to me, price stability is more important than the absolute level of the price. In hindsight, the year was heavily influenced by inventory build in the energy storage supply chain. The more meaningful inventory increases were seen downstream of lithium, most notably in battery cells. It's clear that many battery cell producers had aggressively increased production in the fourth quarter of 2022, especially in China, in anticipation of elevated demand and prior to expiring subsidies. As a result, both cell and cathode producers reduced production rates as 2023 progressed, and spot lithium purchase activity declined significantly. This drove a sharp decline in lithium market prices, starting in late Q3 and accelerating in the fourth quarter. If you think where inventory can be held, we have varying degrees of visibility to it. And competitors, lithium held at competitors, I don't have a lot of visibility, but I don't get a sense that a lot is being held. We definitely don't see any of the cathode producers. And I think that really, there's a lot less held at cathode producers today which really reflects how the supply chain has changed. It, it used to be the cathode producer bought the lithium. Today, they don't. It's just sent to them as they need it by either a battery producer or an OEM. I think if there is any excess inventory, it, it's not in lithium form straight up. It's either in battery cells or in vehicles sat around waiting to be moved. I don't see a lot of evidence that this is a stocking or destocking issue. I don't think the price spike was excessive stocking by customers that then needed to be destocked. I think it was excessive production of battery cells that haven't been sold. But what's interesting about this cycle on the way down is it isn't obviously driven by an excess supply situation or a pullback in demand. And so it's also characterized by some what looks like quite unusual economic behavior, particularly in China. There's a pretty significant expansion happened in China of either African sourced spodumene or Chinese based lipidolite conversion capacity. This is really high cost. There's no debate, $20, $25 per kilo of conversion cost. It's largely controlled by supply chains that are themselves controlled by the large Chinese battery makers. And so it's captive production of lithium. So what it's really doing is taking demand out of the market. So if CATL was buying 100,000 tons of carbonate and it's now making it in-house, what it's actually done is taken 100,000 tons of demand out of the market. And when you look at it that way around, it makes a bit more sense. They're just going to run these plants always as a base load, right? Why? This is all geopolitical reasons. You know, if you're going to make a lot of statements around the world about circumventing China, you know, making it a, a foreign entity of concern, you know, not allowing people to get subsidies if you source from there, talking about building a competitive position against China in battery technology and in EVs. Shouldn't be surprised if China reacts. And the biggest way, the easiest way to, to, to choke off the Chinese EV industry would be to choke off their access to raw materials. There isn't a huge amount of cost competitive raw material in China. And so the fact that they, you know, they struggle with Australian supply with for geopolitics, struggle with Canada with geopolitics, it's not a huge surprise that even if it's expensive, they're securing supply through non-conventional means. I don't see any evidence that this lipidolite and, and African source material can grow at the same rate of the, as the market. It's one thing we know in this market, pricing moves quick when it moves in both directions. It just does. The risk to me today is asymmetric. It's not going to drop 10 more dollars. It could certainly jump 10 more dollars in, in, the, in the next year. But there's also a pretty reasonable and, and maybe a high-ish probability outcome that it stays reasonably stable for a couple of quarters as well. Incredibly opaque. I have sympathy for you all because it's tough enough for us to see what's going on out there. And 
I promise you I'm not hiding from you a whole bunch of sensitive information that I have. It's just hard to get information out of China right now. It is clear that very few lithium expansion projects, including most brownfield expansions in brine, make economic sense at current market prices. And the longer the prices stay near these levels, the greater the impact will be on future supply shortfalls. As we saw in 2022, this will increase the likelihood of a rapid increase in lithium prices at some point in the future. Although the complexity of the global battery supply chain makes both the timing and extent of such an increase difficult to predict. Yeah, I think a lot of the expansions that you'll see that are maybe not, you should take out of your forecast are probably 27, 28 volume is when it would be expected. And some of them are pretty large. If you go through the last few cycles, there's something comes along and surprises every single time. So assuming there is none in the next cycle, then I think we're probably two or three years away from a meaningful shortage. I don't think we're oversupplied at any point in from later this year onwards. I think we're a little oversupplied today, but not, not massively oversupplied today. You can see even in today's price environment, we'll generate over $400 million of EBITDA, but we have a lot of upside if the price does in fact go up. We've sized our spending on capital to essentially say that over the next two years, we will generate enough cash plus cash on the balance sheet to essentially complete the projects that we have out there, which will lead to another uh, 25,000 tons of product coming out of Argentina and another 32,000 tons coming out of Namaska in 2026, and then potentially even another um, 50,000 LCEs in spot concentrate form coming out of James Bay. It's all financeable at today's market prices. If today's market prices go down, that's not all financeable. So we'll take a look at it. What's the right long-term strategy for a business like Arcadium that is going to deliver the most shareholder value? It, look, it's very easy sometimes to take a resource-based approach and say, we've got these resources, we should focus on bringing them online as quickly as possible and therefore maximizing revenue and maximizing EBITDA. But we also have to be sensitive to, frankly, valuation multiples as a public company. Our aim is to drive the share price higher and looking at what will this industry look like if we follow various strategies? I think we've been clear, Liven has followed a strategy historically of protecting our profitability in a downturn. And you can see that today. Like Much of the profitability that Arcadium is, is looking at in today's environment is really legacy Liven. And much of the increase in profitability that we are able to offer as the market price increases, which it will, is really driven by legacy Allchem. And so a lot of the conversations at the board are going to be, okay, so how do we manage this through different environments? How much do we contract? What is the right strategy? Who are the best customers? How much risk do we take on resource development? How much risk do we take in developing more hydroxide assets? What does this business look five years from now? A few more comments before we begin. As mentioned earlier, Arcadium now trades on both the New York Stock Exchange and the ASX which means Paul now talks to Australian analysts who cover Pilbara, Minres, IGO, and many other ASX developers. U.S. exchanges tend to trade at premium valuations to those on international exchanges. This is largely due to liquidity, but with respect to lithium, is also due to the thought that lithium is more a sophisticated specialty chemical than a traditional boom-bust mined commodity, and hence should trade at a higher multiple. Spun out of FMC, Legacy Livent has largely been held by U.S. institutions, including many hedge funds, which cause a certain degree of volatility in Legacy Livent shares, without necessarily ascribing a higher multiple. Amongst the 150-plus stocks on RK Equity's lithium scoreboard, Arcadium has scarcity value. Alongside Pilbara, it is one of only two pure play producers of size, above $5 billion market cap, and hence true proxies for the lithium price. I think it reasonable that global investors of all stripes should benchmark the investment merits of these two companies, not just Livent's historic big three peers, Albemarle and SQM, which are more diversified. The Allchem Livent merger met with some resistance from legacy Allchem shareholders. And with the main listing on the NYSE, there has been some migration out of the Australian CDIs. Alchem, a product of the Oracobre Galaxy merger, had a strong 15-year run from a piddling junior at 25 million market cap 
to a multi-billion market cap producer made possible by major Australian pension, mutual, and hedge funds, as well as long-term retail shareholders, many of whom still own the stock, and all of whom should be interested in legacy Livens, world-class assets, and Tier 1 customers. Rodney and I have had the privilege of interviewing Pilbara's Dale Henderson and his predecessor, Ken Brinsden, on multiple occasions. We greatly appreciate Paul and the Arcadium team for taking us up on the offer to help cultivate our YouTube viewers and podcast listeners, nearly 50% of which are Aussie retail, institutional, and Arcadium's lithium industry executive peers. And with that, welcome Paul Graves for the first time to Rockstock Channel. Hey, Howard. Good to see you. Likewise. Um, so we have a bunch of questions here, and thank you very much for allocating so much time. Um, first question I have is, uh, when you first announced the merger, you announced that uh, you might be changing the headquarters from Philadelphia. So I don't know if that's uh, still on the cards. I haven't seen anything since then, but uh, you had your first board meeting, I think, in Ireland last week. And I don't know if that came up, but we would love to uh, hear just initial thought on, on that question. Yeah, like, you know, we're an interesting business in that we are very much an international business. So the head office is is maybe not as important in Arcadium as some people think. We have some really U.S. support functions there, uh, finance, um, a, a few other guys in Philadelphia. It's actually not our largest office. It's probably our fourth or fifth largest office as new Arcadium. We are now officially an Irish domiciled company, hence the board meetings in Ireland. Um, look, we constantly reassess and will continue to assess what is the right location for our people. The the the, the, the war for talent is is it cuts across multiple industries, but it's especially the case in lithium. People with experience and expertise um, get a lot of choices to where they work. So we have executives, frankly, all over the world. We're in Perth, in Brisbane, Singapore. Buenos Aires, um, Charlotte, North Carolina, Philadelphia, uh, Montreal. So we're already pretty well spread around, around the world. We consider ourselves an international company, more of a U.S. company, and that's reflected in where the exec executives in the organization sit. Okay, so it sounds like no, not a priority to necessarily move out of uh, Philadelphia. I, I thought you might move to Charlotte or something, given your uh, Bessemer City uh, hydroxide, yeah. but okay. You know, we, we used to be there, don't forget, up until... Um, Oh, maybe 2015, 16, we were at the lithium business. FMC Lithium was, in fact, headquartered in Charlotte. So it doesn't have a long history in um, in Philadelphia. And as I say, most of the commercial and the operational teams are, are based either in Charlotte or out in, in Asia, in Singapore or in China already. So uh, moving to there really wouldn't achieve much, to be perfectly honest. Okay. Great. So Rodney and I have a, a whole bunch of questions specific to operations, et cetera, but I wanted to start actually with some of your points. Um, you're talking about you like you need a stable you know, price environment rather than the super high volatility like uh, no one believes. Mm -hmm. the, you know, your customers don't believe $10 is the right price. $60 is also not the right price. But um, and you talk about the, the criticality of incentive based pricing. So like what do you consider to be specifically like a high enough incentive price to justify, let's say, pedal to the metal investing, you know, no slowdown? Yeah. You know, it's a difficult one because I don't know that we should do pedal to the metal investing. I think what we should really be doing is investing to bring supply on in line with demand. And the problem with that in our industry is how long it takes and how easy it is to slow down or to be late with expansions. And so one of the factors that drives a slowdown in expansions for sure in this industry is, is views on economics or availability of financing. And every time you get a, a market that goes into reverse like it is today, frankly, those of us who look at this from an economics perspective start to slow down. People that look at this from a financing perspective and they rerun their models with what they now think the price is start to get cold feet and pull away from the market and pull financing. And all of this typically happens while the equity markets are reacting in a knee-jerk manner, which is a purely linear relationship between a Chinese lithium price and, and the share price. So now equity financing at, at reasonable levels goes away. The reason for stable pricing, frankly, is to take some of that volatility away and allow us to have predictability to 
a reasonable amount of time for an investment cycle. Uh, an investment cycle for a, a fully, even for a plain resource, but on a fully integrated basis, it takes you five or six years to take from from identifying an opportunity to building it. Having this kind of price volatility just doesn't help with the predictability. To be perfectly uh, honest, to answer your question about what is the right reinvestment price, you know, I tend to think in sort of carbonate pricing as a benchmark with the assumption that most things reference to carbonate at some point. It's pretty hard to see looking at the, the, the resources that need to come online um, <clears throat> where they are in the cost curve. It's pretty hard to see how you get stable and, and predictable um, investments in enough capacity once the price is, um, you know, anything more than that, anything less than the high teens. You've got to be in the high teens a kilo. We probably need, need to be near a 20 for many of the resources. For some of us, we can do it at lower prices just because the operating cost of our assets is so much lower. But it's <clears> it's not it's not eight dollars. It's not ten dollars. It's not twelve dollars. You just can't invest at those levels. Not and again, bear in mind, you know, the economic risk and therefore your return on capital requirements of operating in Argentina, operating in Chile. Um, look, even recognizing that a lot of your business still goes into China, these are not 8% IRR returns you're looking for on these assets. You're looking for much higher returns to compensate for all that economic and political risk we carry. That was my next question. Um, Albemarle has uh, publicly announced that they typically target two times WAC mid-cycle, weighted average cost mm-hmm. of capital, uh, and one times WAC at the bottom of the cycle. Um their cost of capital, when interest rates were zero, were in the mid-teens. Um, I think they were they were suggesting, or two times whack was was mid-teens. Interest yep. rates are now higher. Um, do you have a similar philosophy? And what do you think is Arcadium's whack? Yes, yeah, so we have a similar but not identical philosophy. Um, I don't really worry about whack at the at the bottom of the cycle. I worry about cash flow at the bottom of the cycle. Ultimately, I'm being more pragmatic at the bottom of the cycle. I need to make sure I generate enough cash to continue to operate and run the business. You know, it's interesting when you look at look at Legacy Live, for example, and compared to IPO that you mentioned earlier, we did $187 million of EBITDA in, in 2018. We went as low as 32 just two days later and then did 500 last year. Same volume, right? That sounds fantastic, right? We, we've, we've more than doubled, we've almost tripled the EBITDA. Share price at the end of that cycle was lower than the IPO, so maybe you guys can explain that one to me. But um, that degree of volatility, all driven really by pricing, is not helpful to, our, to, to invest in why. That level of share price volatility pushes our cost of capital higher for sure. The fact that you can't lever properly when you know your cash flow can go that low, you're not driving your whack down through leverage. You know, generally speaking, the cost of capital for for a company like Liven that, that is operating without leverage and with that degree of volatility is certainly high single digits. You know, eight, nine, maybe even ten percent, um, depending on how you measure the equity risk premium. But it's it's certainly in that range. And and I know your next question is, so what are my hurdle rates? You know, they're they're largely similar to. Um, to what Albemarle described, we don't reference off our WAC. We try and calculate what an appropriate risk premium is for each market that we operate in. Then we try and calculate what our sort of standalone cost of capital is for each of those markets. We tend to assume that we need to hit, you know, a 10 to 12% return on capital all in across a Western investment, if you will. Once we're investing in Argentina, it, it's higher than that. It may be as high as 20% return on capital. We look to clear before we make those investments down there. Okay, uh, so it sounds like if you, your business is like hydroxide is the only area where your customers seem to be willing to give you, you know, sufficient price floors you, you've talked about and, and carbonate and, and the spodumene, it's all, you know, market based. But if you could get floor pricing, you know, mm-hmm. for the other parts of your business, it sounds like if you can get floors in the high teens, 20,000 carbon equivalent, then, okay, I get you won't do pedal to the metal investing, but you wouldn't stop investing and you would just grow within the market. So that that's a that's something that if uh, your Chinese customers, you know, or or even some of your non Chinese customers who are often confused by research reports that they read like Goldman Sachs or they see the volatility in the like it's very difficult. I empathize with 
if you're at GM or Ford, trying to understand, <laughs> listening to you, saying what you need, and then listening to them and saying that the market is going to be a lot lower than that. So it, it's complicated. Um, but it's about how it, you know, it's, it's a time based question, right? Something uh, you may have heard me say this before you can make a statement that's true today, but not true over the long term, right? It is probably true today that in China, their investments being made and profitable ones. A $12 assumption as to price, but in the long run, that won't work. I mean, we, we have, Mount Catlin's a case in point. Everybody just adds and adds and adds to capacity, but this capacity comes out of the market too as we reach end of mine life, and there will be a few resources that reach that point. And we've seen startups of mines fail. We've seen, you know, inability to get up and running because you're just unlucky enough to bring the mine online in a downturn. And that, that can take a long time to get, get supply coming back on again. I think over time, people are going to look back and see markets like today's blips, just as 60 and $70 pricing was a blip. I think people are going to see today's pricing as a blip. I don't think there's a lot of confusion on the part of the OEMs. I just think it's really important to understand that no matter what happens in the, in the um, high value or certainly the EV battery supply chain, and bear in mind, a lot of lithium is not going into EVs, but in the EV supply chain, the OEM pays for the lithium. It doesn't matter who contracts. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what happens in the supply chain. They pay for it. It all gets passed up to them. Uh, and so that's why you see them increasingly want to take ownership and control of supply. Does that mean they want to contract for 100% of supply? No, it doesn't. Does it mean they want to do it across all of their needs? No, they probably have differing views as to the availability of different types of product. What they all completely recognize and understand that the biggest risk to their business is that their high value vehicles, which are all using high nickel batteries for that longer range and higher energy density, you cannot afford to have that part of the supply chain choked by an inadequate supply of lithium. And that's lithium hydroxide. And that has to be qualified into supply chains. And they recognize, and, and look, they're a long way down the learning curve, but moving up quickly, they recognize lithium hydroxide is not like carbonate or hydroxide into that application. In Greece, maybe, maybe in some LFP, but not in the high nickel applications. And so they look at it and they say, I need to make sure I have enough for my base load. And so how do I make sure I have enough for my base load? I have to sit down with credible lithium hydroxide producers, companies that have demonstrated they can do this, and I need to contract with them. What does it take to get a contract with us? You know, it can take us a year to get qualified. We'll be running a plant or even not running a plant with all the cost that entails while we wait for their supply chain to qualify our material. I don't do that on a spot basis. I need a multi-year contract. And I also need the, as I mentioned, you know, in, in some of my comments earlier, we also need to add capacity to support them. I don't do that if I'm constantly having to choke back my investments because of, of where the price in the market is. When you go through that logic, I don't ever get OEMs push back on hydroxide and say, I'm not giving you a floor price. Right? They just don't. They totally get it. They understand what we need to be credible um, uh, to, or to be capable of delivering on investments. I think what's interesting, though, is as their own battery supply or their own battery roadmap changes and they look at more LFP or more mid-nickel that uses carbonate, they are willing to have what I'll call a multi-product contract in place that allows you to get the same structural terms for carbonate as you do for hydroxide. Uh, you know, we talk about stapled contracts. We're stapling a carbonate supply on top of a hydroxide supply agreement. Why can we do that? You know, because we convert carbonate into hydroxide. I have to make the hydroxide anyway. You can't do that if you're producing all your hydroxide, you know, direct from hard rock. But you can if you start with brine the way that Arcadium largely does today. And so we do see opportunities for sure to get more price stability. It's got to be high quality carbonate. It's also got to be qualified in. But we can go down that path provided we have the right product offering. Um, so it's an important part of what Arcadium strategy is to support customers with that offering in return for more price stability. That's great. And that leads into these questions on Argentina and Japan that uh, Rodney is going to ask you. Right. So, Paul, Argentina is a key for your volume growth. As a volume growth driver, you've got Ombro Murto, Phoenix now, and then all mm -hmm. And Does this solve the Livens, you know, legacy short carbonate issue? 
Yeah, look, I think the capacity we bring online this year, um, we call it phase 1A. We can never get our naming straight, but let's just call it phase 1A at Phoenix. Uh, brings about 10,000 tons of carbonate online this year. Um, that solves our carbonate need. To, like we, our carbonate, we've been balanced last year anyway. But, but now that gives us sufficient carbonate to run all of our U.S. facilities and all of our legacy historical Chinese facilities. And it gives us enough carbonate to start the qualification process for our new 15,000 ton facility in China. Um, that facility, um, because of the ramp up, adds another 2,500 tons next year. And then we're also bringing a second phase on, imaginatively named 1B, which is all connected to the first phase, which brings another 10,000 tons on in 2025. So even without the Arcadium, the Orchem merger, we, we, we will long lithium carbonate. We don't need the Arcadium volumes um, to achieve it. So, but you're right, Argentina is critical to our strategy, it always has been. You know, can you fundamentally shift all of the uh, technical grade from Oloros uh, to, you know, Japan, Carolina and China, and then sell Phoenix's uh, battery grade carbonate without having to upgrade to hydroxide. So can you optimize on your, on your pricing strategy there? Look, we can, and I think we will. It'll take a little bit of time, as I mentioned again earlier. I think there's, um, there's a couple of factors to consider in that one. I mean, as, as you point out, um, the, the all chem resource down there at Oloros has um, two projects. Oloros one, which can produce battery grade up to about 8,000 tons a year of lithium carbonate. When it does that, it produces about 5,000 tons of technical grade as well. Um, it can produce a lot more carbonate if it's willing to drop the battery grade production because, because what the purification loop does to efficiency. But the second phase is, is up to 25,000 tons. It's all technical grade, all of it. Um, the legacy Leiden work at Phoenix is all battery grade. We use, the, as you know, a DLE process. We've been doing it for 20 odd years now. And so just the nature of that process doesn't carry the same impurity profile. And so it's actually relatively straightforward to produce a battery grade lithium carbonate, you know, right from the off, no purification circuits. We don't have a purification circuit. It was made at battery grade. For sure, if we can swap them around, as, you know, technical grade is just a smaller market, fetches a lower price. Um, so for sure, we would absolutely look to do that. We Technically, we can do it. I think there are two obstacles in the way. One of them is the way that all came and structured its financing has, in essence, tied up much of that technical grade lithium carbonate into agreements with Toyota Two Show. And I'll come back to that in a second. The second, the second is every time you change carbonate supply, you requalify, complete requalification process. And so even with a very keen and enthusiastic customer, it can take a good six to nine months to then requalify that lithium hydroxide. So the phase over and the handover can take a while. The reason I'm reasonably confident is that that, that Arcadium and Toyota Two Show are completely aligned about what we're trying to achieve. We want to be the supplier of choice into automotive supply chains. That's not technical grade carbonate. Toyota Two Show largely are there to service Japanese customers and especially the Toyota Motor Company, which is their majority shareholder. They don't need technical grade carbonate. They need battery grade. They need lithium hydroxide. So we are completely aligned that going down the path of producing more battery grade material and less uh, technical grade material is in the best interest of us. It, it drives a higher price and it's in the best interest of our customers because it's what they need. Okay, great. And then um, just if you can flesh out a bit the plans for Sal de Vida in terms of truck or pipeline yeah. to, to Phoenix and, and what the plan is for the downstream on that. Yeah, so Saldivita is a 15,000 ton first phase. It's going to be around about 70%, 80% or so battery grade. Um, conventional pond-based system, slightly different than the Oloros one. A slightly different uh, pro um, uh, process flow sheet, which is what allows it to be a higher battery grade percentage. Um, it is about 50% complete today. The I think... A pipeline or trucking, uh, you know, lithium chloride brine from Saldivida to Phoenix is certainly being considered probably for the next phase, though, given how far down the path Saldivida is. I think there's a greater likelihood that we consolidate um, 
the biggest constraint in that part of the world, which is above ground infrastructure, particularly energy and fresh water. So I think it creates real opportunities for us to be much more efficient in energy use and in, in fresh water use. And I think future expansions, we've already started the process of looking at how do we combine those two to optimize what we have available. Um, the DLE process is, is you know, clearly capable of being used in Salavida, but the reality is that the constraint on um, that has always been fresh water and it's the same basin. So we have to solve the fresh water question. There's plenty of fresh water there. This is not a this is not a dry part of the world, by the way. Not at all. It rains a lot. It snows a lot. People think it's like the Atacama Desert. It is nothing like the Atacama Desert. Um, and so we do think it's possible, but that takes time. I think the second thing is we have an opportunity to expand Phoenix, but our issue has been ponds. We're not in the right part of the world to build ponds. Um, we've tried, frankly, and 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 the the, the ground is not well suited where the Salavita is. So there's lots for us to explore and look into with combining or at least developing Saldivida and Phoenix jointly. Combining is a bit of a stretch, but, but certainly developing them jointly is very high focus of us right now. And, um, and Paul, so with Naraha in Japan, you know, can your legacy live and business help with qualification and, and ramping there? Um, how is the hydroxide at Naraha compare with, you know, Bessemer or, or China? You know, hydroxide is an interesting product in that, that um, <clears throat> it's different for every customer, regardless of, of resource or plant. It's not necessarily the production facility that drives that question. It depends how you run the production facility. Um, I think most people who know anything about um, basic chemical processes will understand that converting carbonate to hydroxide is not a difficult chemical process. It's not a a capital intensive process in the same way that spodumene to hydroxide is. It's so very clean, it's a very simple process. It's incredibly difficult to produce battery grade hydroxide at the end of it all. Some of the some of the know how and knowledge that you need to manage that process is incredibly hard to get hold of. Um, we, we have all that in Bessemer City for sure and, and even in our Chinese facilities. Naraha is operated by Toyota Tusho. It was set up by all chem to be operated by Toyota Tusho. And so far, they have been the ones running that process. We are talking to them today about whether it makes sense for Arcadium to be more involved in it. Um, there's a longer conversation about assets like Naraha, though, and I take no specific issue with Naraha, but it's a non-integrated conversion facility, right? It has to buy its carbonate at market prices from all of those, admittedly but it's not integrated and, and the economics of non-integrated conversion facilities can be quite, can be quite challenging at times. Um, and sometimes they're not, sometimes they are, but, but there's less predictability around that. So I think Naraha is not really about can it produce material, I'm absolutely confident it can, or whether we can help them produce material that is then qualified into a Japanese supply chain. I'm absolutely confident we can. The bigger question is, does, is there an economic um, you know, rationale between op for operating a non-integrated hydroxide facility. And the truth is, it's all part of this conversation that I just touched upon. You know, Toyota Tusho want to solve that problem. We want to solve that problem. It's all linked to where does the carbonate come from, et cetera, and how we operate as a network. And we can spend all this call talking about what that means. Um, so I think Naraha certainly has the potential to be an important supplier into a small group of Japanese customers, for sure. I'm a little bit confused. Uh, why is that not integrated? Because um, if I remember looking at our Cobra, Toyota has, I think, project a, a minority project interest. They also in yep. parent, you know, and they own, you know, but Naraha is what's the economic split yep. between okay. the, how is that different so from who, Bessemer in China? You know, one of the big differences, maybe one of the most fundamental conceptual differences between Live and Allcam was how we finance projects. And Live and tends to finance them at the corporate level. We don't do project financing or asset level financing at all. Um, Allcam went the other path. Um, Toyota Tusho, when they came in to fund all of those, did so with, as you said, low cost Japanese financing from uh, guaranteed by the Japanese um, export development agencies. But Nothing is free, right? Everything comes with a cost. And one of the requirements of the financing is that Oliver's must sell its material at market-based prices. 
Um, and so it cannot transfer at cost lithium carbonate to uh, Naraha. And that's a financing requirement. The, the financing that's in place prevents that from happening. And Naraha does, has no rights to lithium carbonate at cost at Olivos, even though both of them are owned by the same equity shareholders, right? So in principle and in theory, you think we could. Um, the same the same is true at Noir, by the way. Noir has similar financing in place. So it has constraints over its commercial activities. And um, and, and, if, and I know you've probably seen a lot of IFC uh, financing being put in place for Saldivida. If we allow that to stay in place, which, you know, spoiler alert, we won't, that also has commercial constraints. It essentially prevents us operating as an integrated company. And so these are the things that we just need to tackle as part of the merger. They certainly bring benefits and opportunities. Um, it's not clear to me that that financing cost <clears throat> is any lower than we can do uh, at Arcadium holding company level, given our size and our scale. Uh, but it certainly puts constraints on us. And that needs to be fixed and unwound if Naraha is going to be operated as an integrated hydroxide plant. Okay. So you, you have inherited some complexities in your capital structure as a result of all you know, debt deals, which over time will be unwound, uh, you know, depending on market conditions, yep. what equity, what debt you can, you can get, et cetera. Okay. Yep. Um, I have a question on just on, on the, on the chloride, right? There's a Glencore, uh, sign is signing a deal with kind of Galan, which is not far from where you are. Um, and you're saying that Sol Vida, you know, might, pipeline or truck chloride. So is there a market for chloride? Could you see taking chloride from other Solars, right? You know, it, it, to, yep. as, as a means to ramping up. There are some pretty meaningful misunderstandings about lithium chloride, I think. First and foremost, um, lithium chloride really only has two uses largely, and that's either to be converted into carbonate or to be converted into lithium metal. If you convert it into lithium metal, it's going to happen in China. All the conversion happens in China. If you convert it into carbonate, of course, that's what we do at Phoenix. It's what, it's what um, we do at Oloros as well and, and what we will do at Saldivida. But this is, this is lithium chloride. In, um, you know, it's 6% concentration in brine. It's, it's basically salt water. It's not a product, right? You can actually ship lithium chloride to China. We do today, but we ship concentrated lithium chloride brine, which the DLE process is the only way you can produce a pure enough lithium chloride to convert direct to lithium metal. So we take that brine off the mountain to Guemes in Salta. We convert it into anhydrous lithium chloride, a white powder, and we ship the brine back to the Salar and re-inject it into the Salar. Why do we do that? Because that's the environmental permit that we require. The thought that you will be allowed to basically ship large quantities of brine from these resources to China, it's not very likely. And my conversations with the, the permitting agencies in Catamarca and in other areas suggest that they are not going to willingly allow that. Now, can you move it between Salars? Clearly, it's a bit easier to truck brine within a country, process it, and truck the brine back again. These Salars need to be managed. You can't just keep pumping and pumping and pumping until you exhaust them for multiple reasons, particularly of the impact that, that constant pumping has on freshwater uh, aquifers in the area. So it is not entirely clear to me that what Glencoe have signed up for is something they will ever be allowed to receive. And I think if you were to say to Glencore, look, we found someone to convert that chloride into carbonate, they would be very, very grateful for someone to do that for them. Uh, so this concept of sharing chloride across different resources in Argentina it's a nice idea. Not entirely sure people have really thought through the practical constraints or even the environmental permitting permission constraints that will be embedded in that process. Okay, great. Thank you for that color. Um, I want to move on the DLE side to your investment in energy source minerals, uh, mm -hmm. Iliad technology. So Rodney and I have had some experience uh, with them. Um, we were actually retained for a period by Compass Minerals um, and helped uh, Compass select the Iliad uh, technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know uh, of all the DLE technologies out there that it's a strong you know, company, it's a private company. Um, question is like, we've observed you over the years and what one thing 
you know, this merger you did with Allchem was a, a huge deal, but in the last five years, a number of your peers have made investments here and there. You made a small investment in E3, but besides that, this is the only other yep. one. And I looked in yep. the 10K and it looks like you didn't publicly announce what this was, but in the 10K, it looked like it had a $30 million carrying value. So I'm just surmising that, you know, Livevent made a $30 million investment in Iliad or ESM, which for them as a private company seeking to raise additional capital like Lilac is a fantastic thing to say, you know, Arcadium's a customer. Um, if you could explain, you know, is that accurate? Why do you feel you needed to make that venture capital investment? You know, and then mm -hmm. more importantly, what is, like you could have just licensed um, the technology and then what do you expect, you know, um, Iliad to help you to do um, in Olaraz, uh, you know, or Saldivita, or, you know, or, or yep. Phoenix? Yeah, look, I think it's, 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 um, uh, it, DLE is, is such a misunderstood um, phrase, right? The concept of directly extracting lithium, everybody completely understands. So when somebody turns up with a DLE, you know, technology, there's a few people out there running around say it'll just be a little box that you'll wheel it onto a onto a solar pump right into this magic box and out comes lithium carbonate. That's not DLE. DLE is part of a process and has to be part of a process. Flow sheet and one of the key drivers, or two of the key drivers, frankly, of every DLE technology is what is the, the chemical composition of the brine itself? Not just lithium concentration, but also impurity levels and what type of impurities they are, et cetera. Uh, predictability and stability of flow and, and, and other other matters, but also availability of, of, of energy and fresh water, if that's in fact what you're going to use. Uh, can you get an environmental permit to use a DLE that uses solvents? Would you be allowed to get an environmental permit to use one that uses a, an acid as a stripping agent? So there's lots and lots of questions that are not really technology-driven. They're process-driven. This is a process question. Our investment in Iliad is relatively straightforward and why we like the technology there. First and foremost, um, it, it's what we do version 2.0, to be perfectly honest. It's you know, the similarities to our existing DLE are, are very, very real. What, what, what Iliad does and has done a fantastic job is, is actually developing parts of the process around that DLE substrate that allows you to operate at lower temperatures. And for us, with energy as a constraint and operating at, at altitude, you know, you, your water boils at 80 degrees Celsius and, you know, you don't want to be shipping propane or diesel up there. So a low energy version of what we do today is something we've been looking for for a while. And, and we do believe that, that for the brine that we have, the Iliad technology really does work incredibly well. Our focus has always been on DLE that works with our resources. We don't have any great interest in being a DLE technology provider or process flow sheet providers to others. We know that the Iliad technology does not work on every brine and they know that there are certain brines that just don't operate well and that's just the nature of everything. Our investment is really just reflecting our commitment to help support that technology for our own use, but also because we do think it's a very well-run company. We think the management team have a very good view of the right way to think about these businesses. You know, it's part of us making sure that we have our finger on the pulse of next generation DLE technologies as really the only Western DLE producer today and probably, you know, for a while still. It's part of that evolution of Arcadium and its business model into the future is to make sure we have access to the DLE technology we need. Great. Thank you. That was a uh, you know, very good um, color. Appreciate that. Jumping in here from the editing room to tell you about Lithium Royalty Corp. Lithium Royalty Corp is at the center of a global energy transition and manages a globally diversified portfolio of lithium focused royalties in electrification and decarbonization. With 32 royalties on 29 higher grade, lower cost projects from exploration to production, LIRC covers all the bases with well-managed risk, ESG considerations, and a scalable royalty structure. Lithium Royalty Corp is traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange ticker symbol LIRC. To find out more, visit lithiumroyaltycorp.com. I want to switch to um, Quebec. And uh, it's funny, I, I have like, I, we represented Western Lithium back in the day, which merged with Lithium Americas. And it was a 75 million market cap company and a 75 million market cap company into a 150 million market cap company. And they were saying that was going to give it scale and it was going to enable it to grow. And then five months later, 
<clears throat> it was a 75 million market cap company. Um, <laughs> this is on a much larger scale, but what people said to us at the time was, uh, congratulations, you now have two unfunded projects. Um, <laughs> so here you are, you have James Bay and you have uh, Namaska. And Namaska is, uh, you know, you put out a, a feasibility study, I think in your Q3, which was $1.6 billion, you know, a lot higher than planned. I think 1.2 billion was Beckencore hydroxide and 400 million was for Wabuchi. Mm -hmm. You own 50% of this. IQ owns 50% of it. So it's a joint venture. You know, you own now 100% of James Bay, which put out its own definitive feasibility study not long ago. I think you said in your recent earnings call that actually James Bay is, uh, has more engineered uh, engineering done, you know, than Wabuchi does. Um, in your most recent outlook, when you're talking about your CapEx, you know, the CapEx was, I forget, like 200 or I don't know, a small number, you know, focused on Beckencore, which you said is an early stage construction, but that's a very small amount of money relative to, you know, the kind of 1.6 billion. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm just thinking there's a bunch of questions like you own 50% of this. James Bay is a much bigger asset. We, we understand it to be like a very good asset you know, um, might you make a decision maybe to halt Wabuchi, you know, advance James Bay, does James Bay, uh, you know, feed Beckencore, but more broadly, this is a very large CapEx number. You said that Oracobre, or sorry, Allchem finance things like at a project level. If you look at SQM West Farmers and SQM Hancock, you, you know, Mineral Resources and Albemarle, big hard rock to conversion are generally done with kind of like joint ventures. You know, do you plan to build all this yourself or, you know, are you, how this is just, a, yep. these are big numbers. They are the big numbers. So look, I think let's start with what Namaska is and what it's not. Um, it's not a joint venture. Um, Namaska is an independent company that 50% of the equity is owned by Arcadium and 50% by Investissement Quebec. Investissement Quebec is very much the, in, in this, incarnation with us at least an, an investment arm of the Quebec government the financing for an integrated project in Quebec 1.6 billion dollars will not be all equity financing it's unlikely to be project level financing but Namaska itself as an entity does have access to various pockets of capital um, I'm not going to touch on exactly what they all are today but you can imagine there is third party debt there is um, incentive payments from various governments. There are investment funds that are looking to support the development of the battery supply chain in Quebec. And so you should not assume 1.6 billion means 800 million from the government of Quebec and $800 million from, from Arcadium. In fact, if you go look at the government of Quebec's various approvals, which are all public, they've authorized $250 million of capital to be invested in Namaska, which given other sources of funding, they believe will be enough to fund their equity contribution. So I'll, I'll let you think about that a little bit. There's no doubt that integrating Quebec uh, makes a ton of sense, less at the mines. I mean, I think you guys know that there are very few synergies at the mine level. There are some, um, but, but really not as many as there are downstream. And having a downstream conversion capability that can actually handle feedstock from multiple resources is really an attractive opportunity and offering. And, and if you're trying to build a battery supply chain, you don't want spodium and concentrate being exported to China. That's not, that's not your model. The answer as to how and where we develop James Bay and Wabuchi together with Namaska really resides with Minister Fitzgibbon in the Quebec government. He's the, the person responsible for decisions being made with regard to IQ's investment in Namaska, we have made it extremely clear that we would like to develop both James Bay and Wabuchi together and invest further downstream in lithium hydroxide. You can't really do that when I own 100% of James Bay and only 50% of Namaska. Um, Namaska itself does not need James Bay. It's a, it's a very good project. Uh, Wabuchi is a fantastic mine. Um, the Beck and Cooperation, 32,000 tons of hydroxide, hydroelectric fed, um, certainly going to be an anchor supplier to a couple of major cathode converters that are also going to be located in, in the Quebec region. It doesn't need it, but I think Quebec benefits and I think Arcadian benefits if we're able to develop these projects together and collectively. 
as I said, it's not entirely my decision, but I think I've been pretty clear publicly and I've been pretty clear privately that to me it is a real um, opportunity to develop um, multiple mines in Quebec feeding a single large hub. Betancourt could go to 100,000 tons, for example, of lithium hydroxide. So I'd say watch this space. It's still in the early stages. It's still early phase. Um, I'm very confident that we will find a resolution that works both for us and works for the government of Quebec and importantly also works for all the Cree Nation who are the owners of these resources. Um, but as in anything, you know, it's not simple and straightforward when you have government investing in private entities. No, it's not. But uh, in order to lower the cost of capital uh, to China, you know, I think it, it will be necessary as is financing uh, with mm -hmm. good floors, with solid OEM partners. So in this regard, I think within two weeks of each other, I don't remember what happened first, but uh, Ford announced a, a big deal with Namaska for mm -hmm. 13,000 tons of lithium hydroxide uh, for 11 years. Um, it, it wasn't a binding agreement, like some of these announcements say binding. It just says it was an agreement and there was no financing attached to it uh, or announced as there was when you signed a deal with GM for a nearly 200 million uh, prepay. So, uh, and I didn't see, I did see some numbers in your 10K uh, in connection with the prepay, which I'm assuming is GM, which is a question which I have for you, but like, what's this deal with Ford? Ford is kind of like throttled back. They have an issue with Liontown. They've lent money there. You know, was there any money attached to that deal? Is Ford, you know, a significant strategic partner to, it should be, you know, to, to finance this as well as just take the off take? Yeah, look, it wasn't announced as a binding agreement. It is now a binding agreement. So um, it, it, it's not a, an either party can walk away at will. That's absolutely not the case at all. Ford is very much a strategic partner of, of Arcadium through Namaska. I would describe that commitment to Ford and Ford's commitment to be more than just the Namaska supply agreement. Um, one thing that we are extremely sensitive to as a lithium hydroxide producer is that our customers' plans are not as certain as some people think they are. And we, we offer to our customers like Ford and others flexibility as to how they tap into and access resources, whether that's timing of material needed or the type of material needed as I mentioned earlier. So without getting into the details, which I'm, I'm unfortunately not allowed to do um, for various legal reasons, you should assume that yes, Ford are very much a supporter of what we're trying to do. We're very much a supporter of what Ford is trying to do. And the Namaska agreement is an important piece of that, but not the only piece of what we expect will be. We wouldn't have made an 11 year commitment to somebody on a transactional basis. To us, that's a, that's a proper two way commitment or we wouldn't make an 11 year commitment. Okay, and do you foresee making similar commitments with other OEMs um, as part of the broader financing package for this 1.6 billion? I mean, that business model is well, certainly is live, and I'm looking forward as Arcadium has been to make multi-year commitments to OEM customers. We've been supplying Tesla for well more than a decade. We've been um, supplying BMW for quite a few years and have a multi-year commitment to BMW. We have the announced deal with GM and now one with Ford. So. You can assume that part of our business model, particularly in the hydroxide space, is to have these multi-year commitments to customers. I don't need 10 customers of that type. I have, um, I have four, in fact, five, if you count Toyota now, that, that really matter to us and are meaningful and are material. And our focus will be on those five customers. That doesn't mean there isn't scope to add others. Um, but we certainly are very much focused on our existing OEM supply agreements today. And that's like a little bit of part of you know, the, the, the rationale for the Arcadium merger was to get bigger, but to get bigger at our customers, not just to get bigger. You know, if I've got three times as much lithium available, it probably means I'm going to supply three times as much to each of my major customers rather than have three times as many customers. It's just the nature of the industry that we're in. Um, and it's a little bit, by the way, I don't mean to digress too much. You've also heard me talk about being a single resource lithium company, not being a sustainable business model. It, it is if you're willing to just sell spot concentrate and take whatever the market price is. But if you're really trying to position yourself as a chemical company supplying qualified materials into an end market, i.e. you're selling lithium rather than selling a feedstock, 
Um, you can't be a single resource company, is my view. And, and, and these customers don't look at us and say, you're a single resource company. They understood the risk we had with Argentina, but we have two separate hydroxide lines in the US and now four separate hydroxide lines in China plus Naraha, we have a diversity of supply that the that customers demand. And when Namaska comes online, another one, it's just a business model I think lithium has to get to. And as we move in that direction, the customers support you. They recognize it's in their interest too. And so they support you in multiple ways, whether it's contracts, financing, technical help, um, uh, you know, frankly, help with governments, help with subsidies. It's really important to be partnered with OEMs in my view. I think those are great customers. Uh, so Tesla, Ford, GM, BMW, and Toyota. Um, one could argue, getting back to the multiple conversation, if you have ex-China tier one customers who are willing to partner with you long term, you should have less volatile earnings. I think fundamentally, what goes into the higher multiple is earnings quality, not specialty chemical versus commodity, Agreed. but it, um, you know predictability of earnings. So over the medium to long term, I think you know that's. That's great. Um, there's a couple of things, uh, you know, in that I saw like Ioneer uh, change their strategy to make technical grade carbonate, and they have an offtake with uh, Echo Pro, uh, who is in Beckencore. Um, and so that cathode maker actually is happy to upgrade to battery grade themselves. So could you talk about that, you know, with the Koreans? Yep. Um, I don't think you have Koreans in your structure here uh, or as customers, but um, that's one question. And then I have another question about yep. um, ramping up maybe Bessemer City. Yeah, sure. So look, look, I think the making technical grade just is a real reflection of two things. It's just easier and it requires a lot less capital. And so many companies that are doing that tend to be earlier in their journey where capital is a real constraint and their capabilities are less proven. And so it's easier and they'll take a lower price. Echo Pro will not take technical grade carbonate from what I understand into, into Quebec. They'll take it to Korea where they have the capability to convert carbonate into hydroxide. And then we'll ship that hydroxide. They have multiple customers. So there's certainly no guarantee it goes into, um, into Quebec. We will almost certainly be supplying to, uh, battery grade lithium hydroxide from Namaska into the Echo Pro process under that Ford contract. You know, this is this is part of the complexity of the supply chain. There are a small number of companies out there willing and able to take technical grade material and upgrade it either into a, a battery grade carbonate, a battery grade hydroxide, or frankly, even use it in some of the, you know, lower quality battery applications. There are certainly some LFP applications that don't have the same qualification processes or standards that allows them to use a relatively low grade lithium carbonate as part of that process. Um, to me, this all just reflects the challenge on producing really high quality lithium carbonate. Th these processes wouldn't exist if making battery grade lithium chemicals, either carbonate or hydroxide, was simple and straightforward. And it frankly reflects that the battery supply chains recognize they're going to have to deal with different grades of lithium in the future. They pay different prices accordingly, though, I can assure you. Okay, great. So, Paul, you know, in terms of the uh, lithium metal business and the and brutal lithium, I, I picked up on the mm -hmm. call. You mentioned the revenue versus the tonnage of about three and a half thousand tons. It came out to a great number, I guess, an average mid price of around fifty thousand dollars a ton for the brutal lithium. Is that kind of uh, a GDP linked growth, or is there their scope? Because specialties, you know, definitely seem to offer a, a good and and, and high margin. So a couple of things. Um, the butyl lithium business, the three and a half thousand LCEs is not product tons. And so the price you come up with when you calculate that range is price per LCE. And the reason I say that's important is because we make a very wide range of butyl lithium products and everyone goes at a different price depending on what we make. Um, so the simplest way to, to understand the attractiveness of that business is to turn it back into an LCE calculation. Interestingly as well, it tends to be priced on the basis of what I'm going to loosely call a cost plus basis. In other words, we pass on a lot of the raw material costs, the lithium metal costs to the customers. It's a very stable margin business in terms of dollar margin, a very predictable business. So even when the revenue moves around, we tend to find that the profitability of the business tends to be more stable in, in that operation. But I think butyl lithium is a perfect example of, 
um, you know, Howard, you just touched upon quality of earnings is really what matters. You know, we get asked a lot already by U.S. investors, particularly, how can you bring as much stability to the all chem earnings as you've been able to bring to the Liven earnings? Uh, look, nobody would describe Liven's earnings as stable but on a relative <laughs> basis. And I think if you go back to our, our Q3 earnings call back in uh, November, we put a slide out there that shows what was the average price per LCE that Liven had achieved and how much volatility relative to benchmark prices. And, and every single year except 2022, we had a higher LCE price and less volatility. So our average price went up less than the market, but also went down less than the market. Put differently, we built a business at Liven that was designed to protect us in markets like today. It's absolutely what it's designed to do. Um, it's not everybody's view as to how you run this business. And, and most people will say to us, I will put a higher multiple on your earnings as a result of that strategy, if you can demonstrate to me that that, that is it. I think there's an alternative investor universe that we don't even look at earnings and they look at resources and resource size and resource scale and, you know, very simple. How big is your resource? How cheaply can you get it out the ground? And how quickly can you get it out the ground? They're the factors of valuation. They're nothing to do with the price, nothing to do with your earnings, nothing to do with your cash flow. The butyl lithium business doesn't sit well with that investor base or with that model. But actually, if if your view is we need to drive volatility down, earnings predictability up, bring efficiency to our cost of capital, efficiency to the way we finance projects by having stable and predictable cash flow, the butyl lithium business is a fantastic business. It is a GDP grower. Livent has about a uh, 40% market share globally in butyl lithium and even higher in, in various markets. It's a very defensible business. It requires you in the long run to be truly competitive, to be um, have your own secure supply of lithium metal. Lithium metal, as I mentioned earlier, is made from lithium chloride. We're the only company in the world that's basic in lithium chloride that's of a high enough quality to make metal. It's just a fantastic business. It doesn't have the growth profile, but it certainly has the margin profile and the earning stability profile that we like. And then um, you touched on on the call as well about the supply chain and and you know needing to be integrated. Mm -hmm. oh, it's got you on resource versus conversion versus integrated, and you touched on this. But I guess the question then comes to: if you're covering all of those elements, is there an ex-China you know market for things like lithium chloride to be converted into? downstream products and um, and then, you know, I, I guess uh, a market for um, technical grade carbonate ex China, you know, on conversion or is, is that um, is that part of the business one would look to and, and, and try and rather stick to to the high grade? Yeah, look, um, <clears throat> there's no market for chloride outside China, <clears throat> really, to speak of. And again, more importantly, you know, to make it shippable, you, you got to turn it into a product that can be moved around the world, and that's not that's not salt water, right? So let's be realistic about about, about that question. <clears throat> I think, in terms of technical grade carbonate, the challenge with technical grade carbonate is if every project comes online and brings technical grade carbonate to the market, the demand for it won't grow as quickly. Uh, the capability of the industry to use lithium carbonate in technical grade format is constrained; it's it's limited, right? And so. It implies that you're going to have to find a way to upgrade it. You can sell it to somebody with a lithium carbonate to hydroxide facility, but those facilities have all the challenges of any other non-integrated conversion facility. We mentioned Naraha. The easiest way to get around that is to build it in China where capital costs are so low and where maybe return on capital expectations are different. That doesn't help a diversified supply chain. That's not going to diversify the supply chain. And, and frankly, very few people are really building those capabilities today. So technical grade, I think, has to be integrated. It has to be integrated in the, in the long run into a usable product. And the simplest way, frankly, is to make lithium carbonate from it. Um, and if you're going to make lithium carbonate from technical grade, you then open up the door to a strategy that's closer to ours, where you can now start to secure your revenue in down markets. Um, and we haven't mentioned ceilings on these contracts. You know, we also secure customer profitability in very high price environments. So it'll win-win for both of us. Um, uh, but you've got to have a different business model. You've got to be more than just a produce a product with lithium in it and sell it at the best price you can, whatever it may be. That strategy is going to just lead to more and more volatility in the market, to be frank. 
can we jump to the China advantage? Because I was like gobsmacked when I heard that, uh, yeah. you know, Arcadium's 15,000 ton expansion cost $21 million in China and 5,000 in Carolina was 105 yeah. million. But yeah. if you could ramp up Bessemer City, <clears throat> you, you'd be totally sold out. So if you could get government loans or bigger contracts from GM, et cetera, we talk about that and also separately is from an IRA compliance perspective is, is guidance such that Argentina to Bessemer City is 100% IRA compliant. It just matters where it's converted. Those are, if you could address all yeah, of that. I'm, I'm sure there's somebody going to hear this and correct me with the technicalities, but the conclusion is the same. Yes, as long as we move it into the US and convert it in a, in a qualified facility. Um, the lithium hydroxide that comes out of there is IRA qualified. It's significantly different. It's not going to a foreign entity of concern. So you can't do that if you go through China, for example. But, but the slightly different restrictions, whether you're going through an FEOC or whether you're going through a, through a free trade agreement, uh, an FTA country. Argentina is not an FTA country, so that carbonate into the U.S., would not be qualified. It doesn't really matter. There's no facilities to process carbonate in the U.S. Largely only goes into mid-nickel or, or, or LFP um, cathode plants, and nobody's really building those of scale in the U.S. Everyone's building high nickel cathode plants in the U.S., so they need hydroxide. Um, we will expand Bessemer City. I have no doubt we'll expand Bessemer City, and you ask all the right questions about how do we equalize that capital cost. And there's multiple ways. You can get help with the capital, or you can charge a higher price. And there's, there's sort of pros and cons or likely probabilities to both of those different paths. And it, the truth is, I don't think you ever really close that, um, that gap on capital cost. I think operating cost is competitive between China and the U.S. The, the conversion cost is not higher in the U.S. I think the, bluntly, the technical capabilities in China are just so good that there's still this, this, this fantastic opportunity um, to still build in China. And I think it will be big enough that, that we will still look at opportunities in China. You've probably heard me mention that the, the Western OEM supply chain will not avoid China. They will have large supply chains that still go through China, and then they will likely have a separate US supply chain. I think Arcadium is really well placed to, to cover all of that. We are very much in America's business today with Argentina, the US uh, and Canada at the core of our resources and our production. But, but, even today, every Western customer that we supply requires us to supply them in China. And I don't see any of them having their supply chains in China disappear during my lifetime. For the Chinese business, which is the biggest market in the world for autos, if they want to have a China business, then it'll all be localized there. But for the North American side, um, you said it, the skills are amazing. It took it, it, not only cheap, it took them eight months versus two years here in Bessemer yeah, City. Exactly. So, but if you could get cheap, like, have you applied with Jigger Shah and the loan programs office for like to ramp up, you know, Bessemer City and take, you know, Olaraz, you know, maybe technical grade and convert mm -hmm. it there, you know, to meet that, you know, in, in addition to that sounds like a cheaper route than the hard rock hydroxide out of Quebec. Yeah, in terms of capital, it's cheaper. And, and look, I think it's fair to say that anything of that nature we do, we would do in, in conjunction with customers, right? Because actually you don't build that speculatively and everybody has the debate about how long the IRA lasts will it disappear under a different administration. And, and while we're comfortable that that's unlikely to be the case, we're investing in these assets for 20 years, 30 years, more. And so it requires customer commitments to take that material and to and to build it, you know, it, it's why all of our contracts are take or pay, right? Part of the deal with the customer is if I'm going to go through this process of, of producing lithium hydroxide, which is not easy. Trust me, it, it's a constantly um, tightening standard that's put on us by customers and a, and a constantly, particularly in a down market. Once you get in a down market, the cathode producers particularly like to make their jobs easier by demanding a higher quality product and it, their job is easier. Um, so if we're going to go through the pain and suffering of, of doing all of that, we need a long-term commitment back. And the same is true of building, building facilities. You know, every hydroxide facility we've ever built has been built knowing that that volume is already contracted. 
Okay. What we've observed in the lithium industry is that there's often like second mover advantage, not, not first mover advantage. Look, GM, uh, you know, is, and, and Lithium Americas and the, the loan programs mm-hmm. office, that's all supposed to be like happening, but that's taking a really long time. Who knows what's going to happen in the election? Uh, you know, but at post election, it, it seems to me, and you just merged it would make sense that you could sell that you, you could export carbonate out of Argentina, IRA compliant to Bessemer city. You could ramp that up. And yep. uh, if you have an, another customer like GM, you know, that would level the playing field on the CapEx side with, um, yep. with China. Could you see, I, well, you didn't just actually, to be clear, Howard, yeah. I, don't, I don't think it levels the capital play on, on playing field on capital. It helps, but it certainly it doesn't helps. level it. It's and not going to get to 21 keep, million. <laughs> it's not. Look, and to your point, on first, and there's lots of reasons for that, by the way, in, in, including just the sheer infrastructure that's in place in China. Like when we build one of those facilities, we're just building the conversion plant because all the infrastructure is there on these industrial parts. Everything you need in terms of wastewater and energy and power and all this stuff. So there's a lot of really good reasons to what China has built as a country that allow that to happen. It means even if you took Chinese capabilities and replicated them in the West, you don't have the infrastructure to do it at the same cost. But to your point on first or second mover advantage, I think that's actually right. I think the U.S. government is still learning exactly what it wants to invest in because that's what it's doing, right, when it provides either loans or particularly government grants, the first grant program or, or whatever they called it a year or so ago, um, I think two of the biggest grants they made for lithium conversion plants in the U.S. have already been put on hold by the companies that won those grants, right? And so it's easy to go out there with a big statement and, and a big ambition and wow somebody with a fantastic submission to the U.S. government doesn't mean you're going to deliver on it. And I think the U.S. government is now going through that second phase of learning, just as the OEMs have learned, right? They've made investments in development projects that haven't got them any lithium. They didn't do it to make money. They did it to get lithium. And I think, you know, um, people like GM particularly um, deployed their capital very intelligently because the way they've deployed their capital does, in fact, guarantee them the lithium. And I think that's an important thing to bear in mind and consider when you look at how people are looking to support and fund lithium projects. Does it actually achieve what you're trying to achieve? It's like the Japanese loans you mentioned, uh, government loans come with some strings attached to it. And yes, yep. the, 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 the grants look less good in, in hindsight, I think, than, yep. uh, than they were originally. Um, you didn't exactly a- answer my question, I guess, earlier, just on the potentially joint venturing um, on an operation side in the way yep. that, you know, West Farmers SQM did, like in... Quebec, you know, we've Rio Tinto is just out, you know, saying valuations are attractive. They'd love to do something in Quebec. We've heard Agnico Eagle, you know, Mm -hmm. who's a big gold producer. Sabania Stillwater is partnered, you know, on on two lithium projects. Coke, you know, Glencore, you know, have you had had any approaches from any of these or or could you think of partnering or are you going to go it alone on both the mining and the conversion? I think it's about risk. It's about risk more than anything else, how do, how do we optimize the risk return profile on an investment, right? And so if somebody comes along and brings capabilities more than just finance, um, then absolutely we would be open to having a conversation with them. You can see that with, with investment on Quebec. They brought capabilities in Quebec being linked to the Quebec government, whether it's in permitting or, or access to, to capital that, that were attractive to us. I think somebody who turns up and offers me a working capital facility in return for equity or, or, or something else is not likely to be that attractive. I think somebody who turns up with, you know, mining capabilities, I mean, let's be honest, Spodgemy mining is not that hard. And, and particularly post the Allchem merger, we, we picked up a very strong mining team that, that uh, within within Allchem. So not sure that brings too much. Would be would be would we be willing to find a structure with a customer? I think that's probably more likely, right? What I you know I, I do believe that given the sheer scale of this industry relative to a typical asset size, if you can build a multi-location model in the way that we have, there's no reason why you can't dedicate an entire facility to a single customer. Two thousand tons of lithium hydroxide to a, a U.S. consumer of lithium hydroxide, Tesla will take all that in a heartbeat, right? And if you can run two or three of those. If we can link Wabuchi to Beck and Core, maybe a second line that links James Bay to a second line at Beck and Core, and then maybe we can pick up another hard rock resource to a third line at Beck and Core. If each of those hydroxide facilities is run for the benefit of a single customer under a long term contract, I wouldn't want that if that was my only resource and my only asset. 
But when I'm running multiple resources, multiple conversion plans, I have long-term supply agreements with those customers in place. We bring predictability. I think it's an interesting model. I think it's an interesting idea. Are there enough customers out there who share my view? Time will tell. And from an equity market point of view, there's always the question of what's the price mechanism you know, embedded in that because you don't want yep. to be perceived as utility, right? You want the floors, but you also want the leverage to the price. And, and, and as much as you appreciate you know, the long-term uh, benefits of um, vertical integration you know, and the value is going to be across the supply chain, if you look at Pilbara Minerals, right, which started five, six years ago, um, it's a single asset company selling to China has paid dividends, <laughs> generated huge amounts of cash, and a lot of investors, you know, love that stock and are giving it a, yep. you know, a pretty good, a pretty good multiple. That could change over time because Pilbara, Ken Brinson said, Dale Henderson, you know, they wanted to make a midstream product with Calix and they investing with POSCO downstream, but it's yep. still very much a single resource company, you know, and will be for the major, majority of their earnings for for, for like yep. for a period of time. So when you think about if you could convince a customer to long-term, you know, partner with you. And again, I guess they're still learning and there are lots of companies that they could deal with, but not that many that can do hydroxide. You know, there's a balance here. I think you have a preference for stability of earnings, you know, that gets the higher multiple high quality customers. At the same time, these customers are used to buying aluminum and steel at super low prices. So they always want, you know, the benefit of, of paying lower prices and not, necessarily giving you, you know, that upside. So um, I don't know that you have an answer to that. I, I, you know how it is an interesting question. Like, I, I don't I, I'm not ever going to make a pronouncement that we know what the future holds in our industry, because lithium is just such a young industry still. And the supply chains remain so immature. I think we're going to we've been through a window where lithium content and lithium resources been really at the core of um, a lot of people's business model. And, and that's why there's this view that the asset is where all the value is. And I completely understand that. Um, I think it's important to understand, though, that, that, that having more squadrumine concentrate doesn't help anybody in the industry, any customer, any OEM, if there's nobody to convert it into a usable product. I, I try to, without, you know, in any way suggesting this is a negative, a squadrumine producer is no more a lithium company than an iron ore producer is a steel company. Like you cannot take spodumene concentrate without that chemical plan. You can imagine a, a model with purely converters and separate assets, but the problem is there's only one place in the world, given capital constraints and capital costs and return on capital requirements, where you can build that model, and that's in China. And so now we're heading in this weird place where all these resources in Australia supplying spod concentrate into China, where all the conversion capacity is being built, while governments around the world are trying to make the opposite happen and make that lithium not go through China, certainly for Western supply chains. So we're going to have a weird, you know, relocalization of supply chains going on. And being a dedicated spot concentrate producer where your only customer base in China is just fundamentally constraining, which is why, you know, Ken and Dale both have gone through that process, Ken first and then Dale afterwards, about we need downstream partners, downstream integration. We need to think about making our product more flexible so it can evolve with global supply chains and continue to have a customer base. It's a really interesting question for our industry, right? You can't move the resource. Best resources in lithium in the world by a mile, South American brine, followed by Australian hard rock. Neither of those are places where you're going to build chemical plants. I know people have tried, but not so successfully. It's a complicated supply chain that we are building out, starting with the OEM, through the battery supply chain, through the cells, through the cathode producers. Um, it's not yet clear how this all unfolds and all plays out. And I don't think the lithium industry is going to look the same in five years' time. And I think winners and losers in five years' time may look very different than who the winners and losers have been in the last five years. And that's part of the reason that, you know, you celebrated your five year anniversary since IPO. And uh, as I said, you've at the outset, you've underperformed, although I've been a big fan and hoping like the next five years will be uh, a lot better. But I, I see very much like we've always been a proponent of, you know, ex China supply for ex China demand and what we call the North American lithium triangle, which is from Carolina mm -hmm. to Quebec to Ontario hydroxide hub hard rock to hydroxide hub. Um, all you have is North American lithium, you know, producing now you, you have no conversion, uh, but you're the best capitalized, uh, you know, the smartest company who actually knows 
how to do that, right? All eyes should be on you to realize yep. the dream, you know, of the, the, the Quebec being Western Australia and that the quality of the resources are good. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's why yeah, the merger just happened. You've just had your first board meeting in, in Ireland. Um, and there's still a lot to unfold in, in Quebec, right? Hopefully the government, yep. you know, financing think, comes, uh, you yeah. It's, sorry, Harry, it's, an imp it's an important point. I think we haven't touched on it on this call, but it's really important to understand where the lithium industry has been good and where it's been weak. And we've been very weak at delivering on projects as an industry. I don't think any one of us can turn around and say we've got a world-class track record on, on delivering projects. Probably the single biggest focus of Arcadium is building a differentiated project delivery team and making sure we have the in-house capabilities to deliver multiple projects. We're doing four big ones at the same time, right? We're expanding at Phoenix, we're expanding at uh, bringing Salda Vida online, with James Bay to bring online, and Namaskas all to bring online. As an industry, the, the companies will be successful on a relative basis on how well we do a project delivery. And I think it's especially the case that the ability to bring on projects as advertised. And, and that requires a bit more transparency in our industry because, you know, unfortunately, if you go out there and spend a little bit of time looking into, you know, these, these um, feasibility studies, et cetera, you be very careful how you read some of these studies because generally speaking, they don't capture the entire cost. They don't capture the entire risk. They massively simplify projects. Um, one of Liven's frustrations was it looked like all of our projects were much more capital intensive than everybody else's, but generally speaking, as of coming where we said, everybody else is busy being spending exactly the same amount of capital as we have of studies that are now old and nobody holds them to account. But in the end, capital gets wasted. Capital gets, gets you know, um, lost through this process. And, you know, I think you have to understand that as an industry, we have to be held to account for how we deploy capital. We have to be held accountable for return on that capital over time. Uh, one of the reasons why pricing is so important, but it's also why it's so important that, you know, thinking that a bunch of juniors are going to come in who've never built a plant, never mind operated a chemical plant before, will be able to do that. Everybody realizes it's why a lot of people stop with spot concentrate or if they're using a brine or a non-conventional resource, stop a technical grade carbonate. As an industry, people need to give, I think, a, a much closer look to how we are doing on delivering projects and how realistic our forecasts are. Because if we don't, Pricing expectations will never be in the right place. OEMs and battery guys are quite capable of running models and calculating what a, um, a price that encourages reinvestment is. If we keep telling everybody that the cost of that capital is half of what it actually is, we're our own worst enemy. We're just telling our customers that things are cheaper than they actually are. The same is true, by the way, of these disclosures of cash cost of production. They're just meaningless, bluntly, and, and I'd encourage everybody to go take a long, hard look. You can have a company that says they can make carbonate at $5 a kilo, but post negative EBITDA when the price is $9. Something's, something's amiss there. And, and people are not doing the homework and they're taking too much at face value. The lowest cost carbonate resources in the world, fully delivered, it's not less than $8 a kilo. It's not, despite what anybody tries to tell you. Really appreciate that color. Um on non-delivery of pricing, we saw one of your peers having to uh, raise $2 billion in a convertible preferred, um, in part as a result of um, obviously low prices, but also uh, committed delivery to you know long-term projects. Um, Rodney, in the few seconds we have left, uh, we have we love your market commentary and pricing, et cetera. We've kind of like left that away, Paul, but, uh, you know, overnight I saw Morgan Stanley upgraded CATL that stock did well, which we're, we're trying to find like leading indicators. And since the Good luck. Guangzhou futures came about, right. That became a leading indicator, uh, in the last kind of couple of months, it used to be, um, Ganfeng was a leading indicator. So we're thinking maybe CATL is a leading indicator, but we, we I, I, I laughed at your comment that like a very credible person says something. And then 12 hours later, another credible person says the complete opposite um, to refute what's going on. But there's, there's lapidolite in the, you know, the, the environmental inspections, you know, there's mm -hmm. African supply, and then there's uh, th this battery destocking or this over demand of batteries, you know, with an under demand of battery, I guess, what's your read on the, you know, the last, you know, week's worth of, uh, information that's come your way, um, 
predict that I know it's bad to predict, but like, what, what do you think the trajectory is, you know, short term in the rest of the year? You know, I would drive myself crazy if I looked at market pricing as often as you guys do. It would absolutely <laughs> drive me up. It would drive me nuts. I wouldn't even know what to do with it. And I'm certainly not going to make any business decisions on the Guangzhou index or even on China, you know, spot hydroxide pricing. I make this point all the time to people, which is, um, you know, the China hydroxide price represents a product that is not the hydroxide that we are selling as battery grade qualified material. And so it just is a completely disconnected price. The price in China today does have no representation to what we are achieving with uncontracted lithium hydroxide today. The China hydroxide price when it was $70 or $80 bore no resemblance to the price we were achieving for lithium hydroxide in that market. Uh, spot concentrate, you certainly get closer to those indices. Um, and I think that's because the suppliers have an incentive to drive a, an index-driven business. Carbonate is also a well, relatively wide range. The product diversity is wider than people give it credit for. The customer's willingness to contract on the basis of quality, geographic location, you know, what their economics look like just drives a really different outcome. And so we tend to focus more on the fundamentals. We know what it takes for us to deliver projects. We know what it takes for us to deliver to customers. We know that you don't build a hydroxide plant in the West unless you have a customer lined up with volumes committed and at as much pricing certainty as possible, which means a floor, which means a take or pay. We can give ceilings or we can give discounts. We can structure things to pay, if you will, for that floor. But I think over time, we don't make decisions on the basis of where the market is today. You could, you could even argue, to be perfectly honest, if I was being a little bit Machiavellian, that these low prices are fantastic for me because it's just going to drive a lot of projects to be put on. The longer it stays where it is, the less confidence there will be amongst financing sources and others. The projects are viable and things will get put on hold. And if you stop something for a month, you lose six months on that project. So all it does, and that's why I make comments about all this is doing is creating a supply shortfall again in the future, which will be another price spike and then another, you know, lithium rush and off we'll all go again on these cycles. Long answer to, I don't really look at where the market is today. I have a very clear conviction over what we are doing. I have a pretty good visibility over what our business will look like this year. And I have a very clear view as to what our strategy is as we grow to maintain this ability to have as much visibility as possible. I will say, by the way, it's one of the reasons that Live and stopped giving quarterly guidance. You just don't run a business on a quarterly basis, and you especially don't do it in the lithium industry. So we will continue to try and give 12-month guidance or outlooks plus um, multi-year views as to where we are going and where the industry is going. And, and other than the time, you know, I'll just final point, just as a thought process, I, I made this point at the conference, you may have heard me say it, but you know, everybody thinks the lithium industry today is in a terrible place. But if you'd have invested in Livent at the IPO all the way till the end of 2021, you would have seen carbonate at 7 and $8. You'd have seen our profitability going down to $30 million. If you'd have given up, gone away for a couple of years, and then come back and took another look now, you'd have thought the industry has done fantastic because price of lithium is 50% higher than it was. It's higher than almost any other historical average high today at $15. Up until this peak, we'd never managed more than $18 in any given year as a peak and 15 as an average. So that, you know, that's pre this last peak. We've seen demand probably a year or two ahead of what you would have thought in 2021. Um, you'd have a very different perspective if you hadn't lived through the last two years, but instead you'd lived through the last 15 years or 10 years. Um, and so, you, again, you can get way too caught up with short term stuff when you think about what's the value of a lithium company today. Appreciate that. Um, but like copper, you know, and iron ore and steel and other other commodities um, mm -hmm. don't appreciate as, as as much over time. But they're you know, but my grocery bill has gone up a lot. So to say my grocery bill was cheaper five years ago, right, the costs mm -hmm. have increased in this industry a lot. Do you see scope compared to other commodity industries for those costs to come down? Or is this just inflation that we've had? You know, just forget about those old prices. And, and to say, oh, don't complain about, you know, these are much higher than five years ago. The baseline is now like, um, I don't know, 800 spodumene is the new 400, right? Or 1,000 <clears throat> is the new 400. You know what I mean? 
So look, across an industry as a whole, I agree with you. And even at an asset level, costs have gone up. There's no doubt that costs have gone up. Um, I think across the industry, we're not in the lowest cost assets now. The marginal asset is a higher cost asset than it used to be. That's not going to change. I think we, you know, lithium's really different to copper and iron ore in many ways. It's a less mature industry. You don't have these mega resources supplying 20 and 30% of global supply from a single asset. And you, um, you're also, you know, selling into a much more concentrated customer base that's growing incredibly quickly. So while you can learn some things from other commodities, we're just not there. I think lithium will end up there clearly in 10, 20 years, whatever it is. But today you're in a different place. In terms of cost, there's no doubt. There's no doubt the cost of production is much, much higher. If you go back to the early 2000s when SQM was making potash and selling lithium as a byproduct, it's $2, right? And so lithium can be 4 and $5. Carbonate was $4 for most of my time in this industry. Um, nobody can produce carbonate at 4 and $5 anymore. Nobody. And, and lithium hydroxide, 2014 or so, um, FMC lithium had one lithium hydroxide plant which was represented a 35% market share, 9,000 ton plant. Now, what is it, 400,000 tons of hydroxide demand today? Just that change is so unbelievably rapid. There's no surprise the cost environment's changed and will continue to change. And so the, the critique to what I said about where price has gone is to your point. It doesn't mean that industry profitability is higher today than it was then because the industry cost structure is higher. But generally speaking, if you're at the low end of the cost curve, as we are, then your profitability is higher in this market, much higher in this market than in the last one. Again, 32 million of EBITDA last time and, you know, $15, we guided 420 million or so of EBITDA. So, you know, you got to have a little bit of um, got to have a little bit of perspective in some of these things. And that's absolutely right. Even at your low end, 15,000, you know, it's 30. 35 percent you know ebitda margins that's nothing to sneeze at um yeah. and that's we think you know pretty much the bottom um what what's your do you have a credit rating because like albemarle is no. very focused on keeping an investment grade credit rating okay yeah we're a very different business like i think albemarle um there's more history right it's a long it's been a chemical i i, I completely understand i was the cfo at fmc we ran a commercial paper program as you go through cycles commercial paper programs get very twitchy with short-term credit ratings. So I have a lot of sympathy for where the place that they found themselves really, you know, not, I would say through no fault of their own. I don't mean that, you know, they just ended up there. And so I, I understand what they did and why they did it. We've made the conscious decision not to have a credit rating. The truth is lithium is such a volatile industry. If you speak to the rating agencies, they will tell you that if we Arcadium with net cash of 250 million and an undrawn revolver of 500 million expandable to 700 million dollars we wouldn't be investment grade we just wouldn't be right just because there's the fundamentals of the business and when they apply the industry risk factor to you you can't offset all that fundamental credit risk that exists in such a volatile industry with even the most conservative balance sheet they just won't do it fundamentally and so mm -hmm. it's not an industry that if you are a pure lithium company as we are in my view, lends itself to a credit rating. It's why project financing happens and, and, and why we have a revolver that we have no intention of drawing on. That was uh, at the outset when FMC spun you off, you had the 400 million revolver and you financed yep. your development and then you got you actually did confront exactly the same problem that Absolutely Albemarle right. just had and you had to do a convert yourself, which is Absolutely now in your right. capital structure on a fully diluted basis. Um, Okay, let's leave it at that. Paul, thank you very much uh, for no, all of this guys. time. And uh, I very much appreciate, again, this uh, ability to target retail investors and Australian uh, you know, investment community as well. Uh, I think this is somewhat new, Paul, for you to uh, participate in forums like this and, and really appreciate that you, you've done so.